Well, I'm going to get right here in the middle, everybody. Wherever you want to get. Uh, I'm going to be going over, basically going over <laughs> the history of the fire service. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the incidents that has changed the fire service on. And uh, actually, do a little on the uh, uh, equipment. Those who don't know me, my name is Ashley Coons. Uh, I'm a lieutenant in the Lounge Fire Rescue Special Service Division. I'm a certified instructor, so I mainly deal with the Explorer Post and um, have anywhere from 14 year olds to 18 year olds most of the time. Once they normally once they get 18, if they plan on being in the fire service, they go on into the firefighter one class. So then they they'll move up to a station. Uh, fire service or uh, firefighting basically started in in the ancient Greek, uh, they had more or less forced the, sla the slaves that they had at the time to fight any of the fires in in the surrounding villages and and all. Romans kind of had a paid type fire service, and which it kind of moved around at times. Then I'm going to move on up to the colonial times. Yeah. Uh, check here. We always have to uh, try to work on this. Uh, back in the colonial times, all the structures was made of wood. It had a uh, back roof, so it was very easy to burn. Uh, all the structures have to be required to have hooks at the top of each exterior wall. That way if a fire should break out, they can pull the, half, the structure down, whatever type of structure. Uh, each person was made, each residence had to maintain three buckets of water. It had to be full of water, 24 hours a day. They had a bucket brigade. Men would be on one side carrying the water up to the fire and the women would carry the buckets back. Uh, Did you get power? Buildings had to maintain a certain, actually had to maintain a certain distance from each other. Uh, the early fire department was Bailey worked under insurance program. Uh, they had each had a defined area to protect, and uh, they a lot of times whatever the they had several types of problems once they got there because of being paid by the insurance service. Uh, one they might get. A neighboring department might come in before the one that actually is supposed to be fighting the fire, and there'd be a fight breakout, and the fire, the building would burn to the ground. So everybody's fighting. Uh, another thing, uh, they had the wooden fire. Well, in the bigger cities, they had wooden water mains. So actually had to send a team of men out ahead to dig down to the water main and then drill a hole into it. Then they had to put an adapter to hook the hose up to the pump. Uh, and October 8th through the 10th of 1871, the Great Chicago Fire. It uh, pretty much burned down the entire city. Uh, one of the, the class I tell students that Miss O'Leary's cow was framed. 
<laughs> because nobody, the only thing they actually know is the fire started in Miss O'Leary's barn. How it started, they don't know. There's hundreds of ideas from the cow kicking the lantern over to just about anything else. Uh, one of the problems that caught, caused the fire to spread was that there was a big time lapse between the time the fire was noticed and time it was dispatched. Uh, they also, the, all this in the city part, all the structures was made of wood. Sidewalks were made of wood. So that just happened to fuel the flames. Uh, they just, and even in some places in the big, busy streets where there's a lot of businesses where the women was shopping, they actually had wooden crosswalks across the street. So the fire actually just went right on through, through town, real easy. All right, I had to officially it's known as the Great San Francisco Fire which history books call it San Francisco earthquake. But the fire did most of the damage to the city. Uh, the army come in to help with the situation. They divided up the, the recruits that came in. They had one went to help with the fire, one went to help the law enforcement. To prevent looting. Well, when the, they got up with the fire chief, the fire chief wanted them to take and knock down several buildings because the rubble wouldn't burn as easy as if it was uh, actually standing. Well, they went in, they got all their explosives, they had cannons, they blew down every building in a street block. <coughs> Forgot one thing. Got to turn the gas off. <laughs> Fire got big. They didn't do that one time. They did that three times. The entire, just about the entire financial district burned in the area. All right, in 1947, this is another. This one, this incident actually brought in hazardous material operations to the fire department because this was when Texas City, Texas, had their biggest disaster. The Grand Canal ship came into port, and it actually was filled with ammonia nitrate. Actually, had fire started in one of the uh, cargo holes, fire spread, sparks from that went over to the uh, to another ship. That ship caught fire, and then they had a big there was a big explosion from all the ammonia nitrate. Uh, if y'all remember here a couple years ago, at least a couple years ago, it, out in Texas, I had the same thing at a plant. Mm -hmm. uh, this is basically an aerial view of the fire from both ships. Y'all can see it. Uh, What's wrong with the machine? I don't know, it's just, it just doesn't have a bright bulb, bulb in it. And it's got a blink in it, too. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, this here is a, off the, this uh, is a two and a half ton uh, prop off of the Windflyer ship which was the other ship that caught fire. This actually 
flew 700 yards after the explosion, went over the Monsanto warehouse and landed in a parking lot. They also that that's in that at a memorial inside the city there. Uh, they had uh, the fire department actually had 28 firefighters in the whole department. 27 of them died. The 28th was on his way to the to the scene. All right. Today's fire service is roughly 2.2 million firefighters. Out of that, 80% is non-paid or volunteer firefighters. Uh, 15 years ago, the fire service mainly had 80% of their calls was fires. 15% uh, for vehicle type emergency rescue uh, or 5% and 5% hazardous material and 5% of that next was false alarms. Today it's totally off, opposite. Well there's 5% of a medical. Today it's totally opposite. It's about 75% of the calls are medical. Because most of the big departments now they have the ambulance in the station. Uh, and it breaks down 10 for fires, on down five, for just mainly flip the chart over. Uh, well, the personal protective equipment. They have the helmets, which will pretty much is designed with safe, protect your head and it's padded <coughs> it has ear protection eye protection built in the bumper gear were, which is consists of the pants and the coat they have heat layers thermal layer uh, another on the inside a thermal layer on the outside and a vapor barrier in between them this is to provide <coughs> The firefighter with a little bit of cushion <coughs> on the inside to help maintain this temp body temperature. The vapor barrier kind of keeps his, the moisture from his body in, keeping from dehydrating real fast. And also to keep any hazardous materials or any bio-type hazards from coming in to him. The gloves is basically the same way. When a firefighter goes into a fire, it probably, <coughs> once he gets to a point where he has got, he can start feeling the heat outside, he's too close because temperature is generally right around 5,000 degrees. And he has to be able to maintain and back out and start fighting fire from a, a distance. If he's not already trying to cool it down at that point. Then you have the self-contained breathing apparatus and uh, they hold, are designed to hold 30 minutes of air, but if a firefighter can get 15 out of it, they're doing good. There's also an hour bottle and a 45 minute bottle. can't see too well in that picture, but there's one that's, that looks kind of yellow. That bottle is made out of steel. The other one, the bottle is made out of aluminum and it's either uh, wrapped in Kevlar or fiberglass. The difference between the steel bottle, 50 pounds. The aluminum bottle is 30. When a firefighter goes in, he put is basically putting on anywhere from 50 to 70 pounds of extra weight before he goes in. Now, 
working on the fire trucks here. Uh, this truck here is designed, this cabin chassis on this truck is designed specifically for the fire service. It has a 30, 25 to 30 year life span on it. This truck here probably has a 1,250 gallon per minute pump on either a 750 or a 1,000 gallon tank on it. Most of your rural departments, especially like Lowndes County, uh, they have 1,000 gallon tanks on them. Uh, they have some, this is a tanker, probably a tanker uh, pumper type situation. This truck here is a good start off truck for a department because it's inexpensive. Uh, it's not as safe as the other because it's not uh, designed specifically for haul fire equipment. Uh, the cab, I've seen pictures where one of these trucks have hit head on with a tractor trailer and no one survived. The other truck, the first truck, the driver come out with a broke arm, broke leg, another three passengers with him, uh, had minor scratches. Basically they all walked, all but one walked away. It is a lot more structurally sound and like I said, this one here is a little bit cheaper. This one here is a tanker, and it'd hold up to, it's got a double axis, so it'll hold up probably to about 5,000 gallons. And it probably will uh, have a 750 gallon per minute, maybe a 1,000 gallon per minute pump, just depending on how they've got it set up. Uh, this one here is actually a Lowndes County brush truck. Uh, when I get to the uh, incident in Ware, Ware County, this truck here was the only truck of its type there. And it was a very popular truck for the simple reason that out of all the brush trucks that was there, it was the only one that had a remote gun on the front. The driver can actually uh, Firefighters could actually sit in the cab of the truck, drive down the road, and spray water as they go. All the rest of them, they had to pull hoses. And there is nine of these in Lowndes County. Uh, service is provided by the Lowndes County. Uh, fire protection. The vehicle extrication. Uh, we also have uh, swift water rescue. Uh, swift water rescue team has actually been to Thomas County to pull people out of cars that got swept away near one of the creeks off of 84. Also have a high angle rescue team. Uh, they've actually plucked some off of a billboard uh, where the personnel was redoing the board and the wind got up and the, slammed them into the, to the billboard and got injured. So they had to have assistance getting down. Uh, also, at least twice, they've been to Wild Adventures to pluck people off of stuff, roller coaster rides. <laughs> this is before the new manager. One of those, one of those incidents, the cars were upside down. We also do hazardous material response. Uh, Lowndes County and Valdosta is part of a regional hazardous material response team which includes Lowndes County, Valdosta, Gainesville, Tallahassee, and Dothan, Alabama. They can travel anywhere in that area. 
uh, especially to help smaller towns that are in communities that don't have a hazardous response team. The Lyons County ones is basically that we do uh, decontamination of people and equipment as they come out. We'll let the city of Isle Austin and the rest of them have a really bad part of it. Mm -hmm. Also, Lyons County is also in with the city of Isle Austin with the GSAR truck, which is the Georgia Search and Rescue. If you go anywhere in the state of Georgia or the country, if it's called <coughs> uh, when they had the big earthquake in in Haiti, they were actually preparing the truck to be carried to Lake City to be put on transport to go to, to Haiti. Uh, it's a tractor trailer type rig, and if it had a front bump, uh, had a big front bumper and a big tailboard on it, it would not fit in station one at Ballast Fire Department. It got just enough room to walk in front of it and walk behind it. And it's equipped with five sets of jaws, uh, ropes, air bottles, uh, air bags to lift heavy equipment. Uh, and we also do uh, medical assists. Uh, they can be called to go to respond to assist the ambulance. Uh, each truck, each truck. Well, I know there's at least two trucks in each station that has a a defibrillator on board. And uh, one of the requirements is for the state, you have to have. Basic CPR, basic first aid CPR, and the automatic defibrillator training. All right, the fires in our area. I couldn't remember what year it was when Pine Grove caught fire. <coughs> that was a pretty big fire. I think there was about 10 departments to it. Uh, then October 86, the middle school basketball gym burned. There was 10 departments plus Moody Air Force Base there. And then in 1990, the tobacco warehouses uh, Three o'clock in the afternoon, look like sunset. Uh, and there was 16 departments, uh, probably about seven or eight law enforcement agencies assist. Uh, started it. What well, started it? <coughs> Don't really know. It started in, in the <coughs> oldest of the warehouses, the one that was built in 1932, and it went pretty quick. I know when uh, I was in the second truck on the scene, and Lyle Street was actually in flames where the tar was actually, it was so hot, the fire was so hot, the tar was actually coming up out of the street, the asphalt. And it was catching fire and just went on over to the other warehouse. City Hangar lost about. What was the picture you saw that had a little city That's it. The big black. Yep, that's it. That was the back of the warehouse. That's a real dramatic picture. And it, there's actually, that photo is actually back there in the fire department room. And it, 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 like she said, it is a very dramatic picture. Uh, then in 1994, the Stanfield building caught fire. Uh, it, there was about seven departments there. 
We had to call in the city of Valosta with the ladder truck to uh, to assist him with that one. All right, where can this one? It was in 2007, started at April the 16th. Started at the Sweet Farm Road off of Highway 122. Burned clear across, just about clear across where it can. Uh, it's the largest uh, wildland fire in the state of Georgia. At one point, there was 5,000 firefighters on scene. Yeah. Uh, there was only 14 structures that burned, and most of them was hunting cabins and outbuildings. I think there was two, one or two house traders that had let year-round residents in it. They, to help protect the city of Waycross, they cut plows, and it was 21 plows wide. To give y'all an idea of how wide that is, you go out to the interstate, that's from fence to fence, and it's still jumping in places. But once stretch of road, the fire crossed it three times. Once on the ground, twice in the trees. By the time the fire was almost out, or had it completely under control, it actually started back up where it started. So they had to start all over again. Because all that pine straw had fell down and it caught, that caught fire. <coughs> Firefighters that came, came from Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, Florida, Texas, Arkansas, Alabama, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Tennessee, Utah, Colorado, South Carolina, Montana, Washington State, North Carolina, Oregon, Kentucky, Maryland, California, Hawaii, Alaska, Puerto Rico, Canada, the Apache Nation, and the Comanche Nation. Uh, the Apache Nation has one of these top notch uh, uh, fire jump teams. They actually can fly in, jump out of the plane, hit the dirt, start cutting fire breaks by hand. And the Comanche Nation has basically the same the same capability. This I've got a few pictures here of some of the equipment. It had National Guard helicopters, Forest Department helicopters. Uh, at Fargo. Uh, Caterpillar called for the company in Valosta to send a mechanic to Fargo. He quit counting at 90 tractors. And he and Caterpillar Company actually paid him to go and work on the, the equipment. Uh, It stretched into, actually stretched into Florida. The team from Tennessee, they actually had uh, arson dogs trained specifically for wildland arson. Uh, I don't forgot how many arson actually set fires there were. There was two in Lowndes County that they caught. One of, one of the ar arson calls, uh, one of the prisoner, prison guards had bloodhound with him 
he saw the fire start and there was no fire in the area from the big fire. He pulled his dog out of the box, followed the trail right up to the man's front door and the man, when he opened the door, he confessed to setting the fire. Wow. There was only two firefighters injured the whole time. One was within the first few days. He actually, not knowing, actually walked out into the middle of Highway 84 and was hit by a vehicle. He had a broke leg and a broke arm, I believe, right? The second firefighter that was injured was a Georgia Forestry personnel, and he was actually stung by a scorpion. Uh, the, the people over there were very appreciative of the efforts. Uh, Walmart came in, they donated a lot of materials. Uh, there were several companies that donated caps, shirts, you know, stuff that, that firefighters might need, you know, when they were on their downtime. Uh, they had, there was one group there, was massage there, they had a tent set up, they gave firefighters a massage every now and then if they needed to. <clears throat> the Salvation Army started out providing food for the firefighters and it was actually they, the firefighters were actually starting to get sick because it was not the type of food that they needed to be eating. Uh, so the county commissioners over there told, went to them and said, if y'all can't provide the food, we can find somebody else. Well, that first night, Ms. Paula Dean sent a truckload of food from one of her restaurants. Supplies. <laughs> enough food for everyone that was on scene. Uh, he was talking about the smoke. The smoke from the fire actually hampered air travel from Toronto, depending on which way the wind was blowing, from Toronto, Canada to Rio de Janeiro. Uh, one part of the program that I did put in <coughs> deals with the terrorist aspect that the fire service has to go into a lot. Uh, everybody knows about 9-11. Well, actually, the first bombing of the World Trade Center, they were that close to bringing it down. All they had to do was move over one parking space and back up, and the truck would have been parked next to the main support of the building, and it would have come down that day. They backed up to it. Uh, on 